can everybody? Yeah. Uh, so I decided to simplify the title because it's really mouthful, as you noticed. <laughs> Uh, and by the way, um, if we are running out of time, even emergent supersymmetry will become an optional topic. Let's see if we can make it. There are several slides. So this is the plan of the talk. Uh, I want to introduce you, uh, well, you have seen it several times already uh, during the conference, to the local potential approximation, but in a slightly different way, only mildly different. And, uh, and then I want to show you how to uh, derive uh, through the epsilon expansion uh, um, unitary multicritical models uh, and through a new expansion uh, non-unitary multicritical models using the local potential approximation. And finally, if we have time, we're going to talk about uh, emergent supersymmetry. Uh, so this is the brief introduction to the LPA. As I said, it's uh, slightly different. Uh, I want to start as a uh, in a top-down approach, let's call it. So I'm uh, uh, suggesting to pick up our favorite uh, renormalization group flow, for example, through the Vetterich equation, and uh, I'm defining what it is, the, what it is known as the next-to-leading order in the derivative expansion as a, a truncation of the space of all uh, functionals uh, which are flowing through the RG, which contains the most general uh, uh, terms up to second order in the derivatives of a scalar field phi. Now, uh, if you have your RG flow and you have your truncation, in this, uh, you can uh, project the RG to your truncation and derive a flow for an effective potential and uh, uh, a field-dependent uh, wave function renormalization in this way. So, this is kind of a top-down because uh, uh, through the second order derivative expansion, I want to define what I call uh, as the local potential approximation. If you pick up your truncation in the next to lean order, you can, uh, you can approximate it so that the wave function renormalization is just one or it's just a, a scale dependent constant in phi. And in this case, you obtain what we typically call as the local potential approximation or the local potential approximation prime. Now, the local potential approximation prime is the one that I'm interested on because uh, if you further redefine your fields into dimensional, uh, dimensionless renormalized quantities, uh, like so, uh, you can uh, extract through the LPA uh, a formula for the anomalous dimension of your scalar field. So the, the, the flow that we just considered hides some explicit cutoff dependence uh, which, is, uh, which, is, uh, which appears through explicitly through the cutoff and a modified version of the propagator that contains the cutoff. So as I said, uh, I like the idea of starting from the next to leading order of the, um, of the uh, derivative expansion because uh, I'm uh, able to, even if I'm taking the limit of a constant uh, Z, which goes into the local potential approximation prime, uh, I'm still able to retain a kind of a flow for a field-dependent wave function renormalization, and I will use it later. So if you move to dimensionless quantities, uh, uh, this is how the flow looks. Um, for example, the flow of the potential in the, in the specific limit uh, has a scaling uh, part, uh, which is just canonical scaling, and then uh, I'm writing it as a series, you will see why. Uh, of powers of the second derivative uh, of the renormalized potential. Now, all the constants that you see here are cutoff dependent. So they depend on G, they depend on R. And they're fixed once you fix uh, the cutoff, but I don't want to fix them for now. And likewise for the flow of the wave function renormalization. Now, my objective, as I said, is to obtain uh, 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 unitary critical models uh, using the local potential approximation. Now, to define what uh, the unitary critical model, I want to define uh, what, what it is, I want to do it uh, by starting, uh, starting by from their, uh, let's call it uh, bare version of the potential. So, a phi to the n critical model is characterized by an interaction of the type phi to the n and by a coupling. Now, the coupling, the model has uh, an upper critical dimension, which I call uh, dn, and uh, it's the dimensionality for which uh, the, the coupling in front of the, uh, of the interaction is, uh, uh, is dimensionless. 
So for example, for n equal to one, uh, which would be phi square, the upper critical dimension is infinity, so this is just a massive theory, uh, non-interacting. n equal to two is phi to the four, and we know it has upper critical dimension four. Phi to the six has upper critical three, and so on. Now, to study these models in the epsilon expansion, what you typically do is uh, you have uh, this, these theories which are Gaussian at the upper critical dimension, and you're going slightly below the upper critical dimension by expanding uh, the dimensionality in epsilon from the critical dimension. And uh, what you know is, uh, we know it uh, because we, we know that uh, these models have uh, non-trivial phases. Uh, they all have non-trivial theories below the upper critical dimensions. Uh, another condition is that if epsilon goes to zero, you are uh, going back to the upper critical dimension and the theory should become Gaussian in this way. Now, there is a small appropriate scaling which uh, will turn out to be useful and it's a technical. I'm redefining the field uh, in this way uh, using uh, a cutoff dependent uh, constant as well as uh, the dimensionality and uh, the anomalous dimension. And uh, this is the new rescaled field that I'm considering, the variable x. It's, uh, the reason why I'm doing this rescaling is that in this way, the flow of the potential is uh, a second order, um, let's call it a differential equation, normalized to one half in front of the power one of the second derivative of the potential. And uh, this will turn out in a second particularly useful. So, here I'm using, by abuse of notation, I'm using the same names for the cutoff dependent constants, even though they are actually rescaled uh, through this mechanism. And likewise for the uh, wave function renormalization, field dependent wave function renormalization in this limit. So, the, the fact that uh, the uh, second order, sorry, the fixed point equation for the, for the flow of the potential uh, is like this with the cutoff dependent part. But uh, if, you, if you think about the fact that uh, close to the upper critical dimension, the potential should be small because it has to interpolate with the Gaussian solution when epsilon goes to zero, it is legitimate to just, uh, uh, in, in a first order approximation, to just uh, compute fixed point solutions by solving uh, the linear equation here. And then eventually add orders coming out from the powers of the second derivative. So uh, it's useful to define this operator. And uh, it, uh, as I said, in the limit epsilon equal to zero, the solution should be a solution of this, uh, of this linear equation. So it's just d acting on the potential equal to zero, should be x here. And uh, we know the solutions, the, the bounded solution, power law bounded solutions of, uh, the second, of this second order differential equation are the permit polynomials. And they are characterized by the index n, which is the index of the critical theory. So the idea behind uh, solving in the epsilon expansion the LPA uh, is, uh, is the idea behind giving this ansatz uh, to the potential solution, which is proportional to the, to the Hermit polynomial, the 2 nth Hermit polynomial. Now, since the equation is linear, is linear the ansatz is not determined by uh, does not determine the overall coefficient of the ansatz. We know it has to be somehow proportional to epsilon because the solution has to go to zero for epsilon goes to going to zero. But then there is uh, still an unknown coefficient uh, cn. And uh, how do we fix the cn? So the advantage of having defined the operator dn and using the Hermit polynomials is that uh, the, uh, the operator dn generates uh, uh, terms which are uh, orthogonal to the Hermit polynomial h to n. So, and uh, we have a norm, which is e to the minus x squared. So we have orthogonality conditions, but we also know integrals of three Hermit polynomials, which, have, which are bounded uh, for certain values of the coefficients. And uh, so from the ansatz, uh, we can, uh, uh, and thanks to the properties of the of d and the Hermit polynomials, we can uh, uh, to any desired order in epsilon, we can construct uh, the, the potential, the rescale potential, as uh, uh, an expansion in the parameter epsilon and uh, using the Hermit polynomial. So this is how the, um, the expansion in epsilon of the potential looks. 
And likewise, since I retain the ability of talking about uh, Z dot, I can, uh, I can project uh, over Hermit polynomials and construct formulas for the anomalous dimension, again, as an expansion on the powers of epsilon. So this is interesting because uh, uh, there is an exploit of this fact. Uh, I can determine eta, eta uh, by projecting the flow of the wave function randomization, even if it is field dependent in this limit, and I'm projecting over the zeroth Hermit polynomial, and, uh, and this is, in practice, a new way of computing uh, eta uh, in the local potential approximation, which I've seen uh, only in uh, papers by Osborne and Twig, uh, but I've never seen exploited in the functional G literature. So this would, would be how the formula looks like, uh, and uh, it's an integration using the norm, so it's basically an integration of the, over the field. And uh, so this is just a small uh, detour uh, from what I was saying, but uh, this eta has some nice properties. For example, it's non-zero even when uh, the third derivative of the potential is zero at zero. It's, uh, it correctly interpolates, uh, uh, well, almost correctly interpolates uh, uh, with the perturbation theory result. You will see uh, it's proportional to epsilon squared when epsilon is going to zero, so it's behaving like a perturbation theory. And uh, since the measure decays fast, you don't really need global solutions in principle. So if you have them, it's better, but uh, you can compute uh, this anomalous dimension by just having uh, a solution which lives on a finite size uh, if you didn't uh, solve the full asymptotic behavior. And uh, this formula admits uh, a generalization to D dimensions. Uh, if you want to see the Polchinski's version, just look at this paper. So, you can solve, as I said, iteratively, order by order in epsilon, and obtain all the coefficients of the ansatz that I was showing you before as a function of n, which is very interesting. And again, uh, I suggest you to see uh, Osborne's papers for the Polchinski's version. So we have, uh, uh, for example, up to order epsilon squared. It's uh, relatively easy. You can have an analytic form of the solution. Uh, which depends on n. So it's not, uh, you, you can, by, by setting up n, you can uh, uh, choose the, crit the kind of critical model that you are interested on. So uh, another nice uh, excursus detour would be that, uh, uh, in principle, there is a new criterion uh, which you can use together with others uh, for optimization, which would be what I call epsilon square matching of the anomalous dimension. So we know that uh, the LPA uh, that we consider does not include all operators which are generated at one loop or two loops or uh, any order of loop that you, that you so desire. So it's not, for example, two loop exact. Uh, but what you can do is uh, you know the result from perturbation theory, which would be this eta pt, which is the left-hand side of the formula. And you can try to match the perturbative result with the uh, with the result which comes from the LPA, which depends on the cutoff, uh, even though it behaves correctly in epsilon square, uh, it depends on the cutoff, and so you can use, uh, you can simplify this formula and try to constrain uh, the cutoff dependence based in, in using the fact that uh, you have the cutoff freedom to try to match the perturbative result. Again, I'm not saying that the LPA that the functional G uh, gives a wrong eta. I'm saying that the truncation uh, to the local potential approximation gives uh, a wrong eta. So this is nice because, uh, as I said, if you have a parametric dependence uh, of the cutoff, you can try to fix uh, at least one parameter uh, using, uh, uh, using this formula. And I'm saying that Polchinski equation, uh, so this, is, this goes for Vatterish equation. Polchinski equation does it automatically even though it's a little bit tricky, Polchinski equation in the LPA does not depend on any parameters, so there wouldn't be any chance to actually display a wrong result in that case. But it would be a matter of debate. So um, to compute the spectrum of the solution, we just uh, deform in a standard way the rescale potential. And uh, the linearized equation for the deformations uh, uh, also uh, contains the operator D. So what you can do is uh, you can uh, compute uh, the spectrum for the part which is proportional to the operator capital D, which is just uh, a normal spectrum uh, uh, labeled by 
natural numbers, and, uh, and then use the quantum mechanics perturbation theory order by order in epsilon to compute the corrections. And uh, the result is pretty nice. Uh, the, the spectrum up to order epsilon, which is this guy, uh, is fully universal in the sense that uh, it's exactly the same that you would obtain from perturbation theory and does not depend on any cutoff. So um, if, uh, it agrees basically with the scaling dimensionalities of the operators phi 2k, each of them living in the, uh, in the 2n theory. The, this is a lucky coincidence, I would call it, because uh, the mixing between uh, uh, some operators, uh, which would go beyond the LPA, is relatively simple and ensures the fact that uh, uh, this formula is universal. So um, um, it's not a general property, I would say, of uh, the local potential, but it is nice to have. So for example, this is the spectrum of the Ising class, and this is the spectrum of the critical uh, Ising, which goes for n equal to three. Um, of course, you can check the spectra for, I mean, this is a super simple spectrum, but you can check for um, uh, universalities. So this is just the volume scaling. Uh, and these two, uh, sorry, uh, this guy and this guy you can determine directly from the anomalous dimension if you are interested. So this is all nice, uh, but what about uh, beyond the epsilon expansion? Well, you can pick up your uh, analytic solution to order epsilon square, and um, um, you can pick up your analytic solution and compare it with some uh, numerical uh, estimate based on uh, any method. So for example, this is for uh, the easing class uh, at epsilon equal to one over 10, so slightly very close to d equal to four. Uh, you see that the dashed one is the uh, numerical one and uh, the thick one is uh, the, the analytic one. They basically coincide. But uh, if you go all the way down to uh, d equal to three, so for epsilon equal to one, uh, the two solutions are uh, quite different. Now, we know that the, by comparing terms, we can estimate that the expansion is supposed to fail uh, at around uh, epsilon times x squared equal to one. And we also know by the original scaling that it has to fail for d equal to two. So this is not a good method for d equal to two. Of course, you should be using full numerics, or since you know what are the CFTs, you should be using CFT. Uh, the second part of the talk, and I guess I will be skipping the third one um, because of time constraints, is to basically repeat this analysis uh, for uh, non-unitary theories and uh, using this new thing which I call epsilon to the one-half expansion. So uh, we are now interested to uh, fight to the two n plus one critical models and uh, I'm putting a, an imaginary unit in front because uh, uh, there is actually a, a, a general, a more general uh, uh, symmetry different than par simple parity, which is protected uh, by the functional RG, by, by any functional RG equation, which would be under parity, the potential goes into, into its complex conjugate. And uh, for example, if you, if you split your potential into a symmetric and an anti-symmetric part, uh, the anti-symmetric part, uh, thanks to this property, has to have a, an imaginary unit in front. And uh, so, in principle, we can have so anti-symmetric solutions, like phi to the 2n plus 1, and, uh, but we need an imaginary unit in front. Uh, so these are the, potential, the bare potentials that I'm interested in, and these are their critical dimensions. So 6 would be the critical, uh, upper critical dimensions of the Li-Yang model, if you if you're familiar with that. So the new ansatz uh, involves uh, solving at lowest order the, the differential operator that we defined above, but with index 2n plus one. And uh, I, I found that a consistent expansion does not rely on an epsilon expansion, but it relies on a square root of epsilon expansion. So you start with an anti-symmetric part, which goes like square root of epsilon, but then there is an, a symmetric part, which goes like, like epsilon, and if you keep going, uh, there will be uh, epsilon to the three half, anti-symmetric, uh, epsilon to the two, symmetric, and so on. The anomalous dimension, differently from the previous model, is proportional to epsilon, which, is, uh, which means it's non-zero at order epsilon. And uh, as all physical quantities, it's analytic in epsilon. So the potential does not have, uh, the potential can expand into a square root of epsilon, but uh, critical exponents and anomalous dimension uh, will not. Will, they will expand into 
uh, integer powers of epsilon. And the parity, as we saw it, implies that this coefficient has to be purely imaginary. And uh, this is, for example, what you get for the uh, Li Yang class. This is n equal to 1 the th at uh, dimensionality 5.9, so slightly below the upper critical 6. Uh, the solution has the, an the anti-symmetric part, which is the imagine purely imaginary part and the symmetric part, which is the dashed curve. It's like an inverse parabola at uh, order epsilon. So this is the spectrum, which you can compute. It also has some uh, uh, spectral relations among uh, the, the entries. So I have a, a small conjecture and uh, a candidate other model. So the conjecture would be that uh, these solutions, which we know from the upper critical dimensions, uh, should interpolate uh, with uh, some a series of unitary uh, non-unitary CFTs, uh, which is uh, m2 to m plus 3. Uh, we, uh, I know I'm right for n equal to uh, 1, because uh, m2 5 is uh, the Li Yang that you have seen before. Uh, but this would be an interesting thing to, to try to understand a little bit uh, better. A corollary is that uh, we know that M27, which is n equal to 2, is, uh, is in the same universality class as the bloom capel model, which is coming from uh, the study of spin chains. And it's a, a tricritical uh, uh, non-emission model at imaginary magnetic field. So it's, uh, it's new, it's interesting, and uh, it's not that explored. There, is, there are only a couple of papers by von Gehlen. And uh, a nice uh, observation for this bloom capel model would be that uh, the upper critical dimension is slightly above 3. And so the epsilon expansion is expected to work well uh, I hope, uh, on, uh, in dimensionality 3, which is uh, a dimensionality interesting for natural reasons. So there is, uh, I hope there is more work to come on this topic. And I will be skipping this part and go straight to the conclusions. So the conclusions for the first part uh, is that several features of Vetterich flow uh, and the local potential approach uh, can be appreciated by solving it uh, through the epsilon and the square root of epsilon expansions. At least this is my feeling. Uh, I've learned a lot by doing these expansions on uh, how the solutions actually develop from the upper critical dimension and how they are structured. Uh, the approach suggests new ways to compute eta, which are in principle useful also for numerical reasons. And uh, a criteria for optimization, uh, which I think can be explored, uh, because uh, it might give better results for the anomalous dimensions. And what you have not seen <laughs> is that uh, you can use the local potential to uh, you can generalize the local potential for supersymmetric applications and uh, if study the emergence in the infrared of uh, uh, supersymmetry. For this part, I suggest you to, uh, to find uh, Tobias, uh, and, uh, which has a nice poster on emergent supersymmetry, and, uh, uh, and ask him a lot of questions. Thank you. <laughs>